Uh, welcome back. I uh, wanted to take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Valerie Neal, Curator and Chair of the Space History Department here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. It's really a pleasure for me to introduce her. I've known uh, Dr. Neal for over 20 years. 20 years. So with that, Dr. Valerie Neal. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see you here, and quite frankly, I'm relieved to see you here. Uh, I know that some of you suffered a real disappointment over the weekend, and uh, I feared that that might dishearten you and, and send you home instead of coming from Florida uh, back up here uh, to the conference. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd just like to offer a word of encouragement to those of you who lost an experiment or um, who have shared in the disappointment of others who lost an experiment. Um, the experiment was lost, the thing was lost, but the knowledge was not lost. What you've learned in this process is still yours. Nobody can take that away from you. And the experience you've had over the last several months uh, working in this program is yours. And that's not lost either. And I believe that um, you're going to have another chance uh, to do an experiment. And I also believe that what you've learned and what you've experienced thus far is going to help you in everything else you do, whether it's a, a history project at school or another science project, or uh, if you're a musician or a dancer or an athlete, uh, the kind of discipline that you have experienced in working in this program is gonna help you in everything else you do. So uh, I hope the loss is a temporary setback. I'm confident it won't be a permanent setback. So thank you for coming. I'm glad to see you here. I'm a historian, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I have had the pleasure of working with spaceflight and particularly with scientists who've flown experiments on the shuttle and on the International Space Station for a number of years. And so I wanted to recap a little bit of what I think you know already uh, about what a difference that microgravity makes. On my slide here, you'll see one of my favorite emblems, which is the microgravity symbol, uh, the Greek letter mu and the G for gravity. And you'll notice that in some of the uh, shuttle mission patches, uh, the crews acknowledged that they were doing microgravity research. And in the uh, STS-107 patch there on the right, you'll see that the M and the G is actually incorporated into the astronaut symbol there at the base of those three rays. Uh, microgravity research really didn't exist as a field at the beginning of the space shuttle era. And it was the space shuttle that made it possible for scientists to start doing enough research in space that they were able to form essentially a new field. Uh, there had been a little bit of work on rockets and balloons, but the space shuttle made it possible to do sustained research, which is now being done on the International Space Station. You know a lot about the International Space Station, and my point in this slide was just to bring up uh, that the shuttle actually paved the way to the International Space Station, and a lot of the research that is being done on the space station now had its origin uh, in the 1990s and 1980s with the same kinds of experiments being done on the space shuttle. And even before that, in the 1970s on Skylab, there were precursors to some of the material science experiments in particular, and a couple of animal experiments, the famous uh, uh, experiments, the famous uh, Anita, uh, the spider, uh, was on Skylab. So there's a, a history to this that now goes back into the 1970s and even a little earlier than that, on the uh, Apollo missions to the moon, NASA made room for a few little experiments. So scientists have known for quite some time that space is an out of this world place to do research and things can be done in space that can't be done elsewhere. And so it's a different world up there. And these are some pictures of some of the fun aspects of being in space. And uh, the astronauts love uh, to demonstrate the tricks they can do when they're floating in weightlessness. 
how they can play with food, they can juggle with tomatoes and apples, um, they can uh, go after floating goldfish and M&Ms, uh, their hair floats up into big halos uh, around their heads, and, and, but that's not all just fun. I mean, it's fun to look at and it provokes a lot of laughter, but, but that's really the kind of the foundation of what's happening there that enables you to do scientific experiments in space. Uh, the fact that weightlessness creates a whole different environment where things that don't happen on Earth can be studied uh, in the space environment. And particularly then, microgravity is a wonderful place to do experiments in a variety of disciplines of science because the, the rules that hold here on Earth don't hold the same way um, in weightlessness. And I think those of you who have worked on experiments have been engaging directly with the difference in that environment. Uh, but when you, th when you think about it, um, space isn't just a place to go to look at the stars or to look at the Earth's atmosphere or to look down at the Earth. Space itself becomes a laboratory where you can do the same kinds of research you can do on Earth, but with different variables. And uh, it's, a, it's uh, an exciting place to do biology, exciting place to do chemistry, uh, basic physics, uh, to mess around with materials and see what happens when you melt things and they solidify, or if you're trying to create a new mixture of um, materials that won't mix well on Earth and they mix much better in space. It's really very exciting. And then I think one of the most interesting fields of research that they've been doing in space is with combustion, uh, actually setting fires, small fires inside the International Space Station. You think about it, a fire is the last thing you want to have happen in a spacecraft uh, because you're in this enclosed environment. But if you do it right, if you do it in a closed container uh, with very carefully controlled conditions, you can do some very ex interesting experiments with fire and uh, smoke and soot and all of that. So my point is that odd things happen in space and it's in that oddity that there's room for us to learn new uh, information about how things work, how things behave, uh, what are the fundamental principles when they aren't being masked by gravity. And uh, uh, one of my favorite pictures is the picture there of the flame, uh, flame on Earth and right next to it a flame in space. Uh, fires turn into little balls of flame and they can go floating around. Uh, imagine if they got loose. Uh, in your spacecraft, you would be in real trouble uh, if fire were floating around like the M&Ms float around. But it's very interesting for scientists to be able so, to see what exactly is going on inside a flame and how do things burn, really, when gl gravity isn't the dominant force on them. Or uh, you see the picture of uh, an astronaut playing with a sphere of water uh, that's probably been squirted out of a drink bag. And uh, they can do all kinds of experiments, just uh, casual experiments, uh, with strings and M&Ms and bubbles of water. They can set these uh, bubbles or spheres rotating and watch them turn into dog bones and then split apart into two uh, spheres. They can poke an M&M into it and uh, it, the sphere doesn't burst, it just swallows up the M&M, and then you can see the M&M rotating inside it. Uh, things that have to do with fluid dynamics that you can't see in the same way here on Earth. And uh, so odd things happen, but those odd things uh, really are fascinating. So we go into space to study processes uh, that we want to learn about or phenomena that we want to learn about when they aren't masked by gravity. And so without an up and down, uh, without uh, things mixing the way they mix here on Earth, uh, you can investigate um, the pure processes, you might say. Uh, you don't have stirring, you don't have settling out in solutions. 
Uh, you have things that solidify much more evenly. You can process materials without putting them in containers. Because when you think about it, when you pour water into a container, the container itself is exerting some force on the water. So if you can do containerless studies, you can see characteristics that you can't see here on Earth. And um, it's, it's fascinating to be able to reveal those basic phenomena and characteristics. I, I put this picture of microgravity man uh, on this slide because one of the NASA centers in Ohio, the, uh, now it's the Glenn Research Center, uh, had a very active educational outreach program and one of their scientists who is a microgravity scientist would appear as microgravity man and he would go out and do talks in the community or when they had open house at the NASA Center, he would appear and he would talk about uh, all of these kinds of phenomena that are possible in weightlessness. So uh, that might be a role some of you might like to adopt in your schools uh, or in a science fair or something. You might want to become microgravity kid or a microgravity student or something and, and uh, teach your friends and uh, colleagues about microgravity. Uh, the astronauts, of course, serve as guinea pigs or experiment subjects in space because the human body is a remarkable uh, organism and everything about it responds to weightlessness and then reverse responds when they come back to Earth. And so just studying the human body can reveal so much about the organs, the systems we have, and what's fundamentally going on with them. And sometimes what goes on when things go wrong in the body, when uh, people develop certain kinds of diseases or uh, physical conditions that are debilitating. And by studying the body in space, much can be learned about that. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of interest in plant studies, uh, both for their practical application here on the ground to learn more that might be of benefit to agriculture, let's say, uh, or to learn about um, how to grow small foods for people who might eventually go on long journeys uh, to the moon or Mars or set up bases there and might get tired of freeze-dried packaged food and might want a fresh salad or fresh strawberries or something to spice up their diet. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting work going on uh, with plant studies in space, both to learn the basics of plant uh, biology and also practical applications. And I should say about the astronauts too, not only do we want to understand what's happening in their bodies now while they're in space, but what's the course of those changes and what does that mean for long voyages out into the solar system? Uh, if people were to go on a mission to Mars, say a three-year round trip, what kinds of um, uh, deterioration would their bodies be subject to? What kinds of exercises and other remedies would they need to practice during that three-year period so they would still be able-bodied when they came back into our 1G field and uh, so they wouldn't be uh, disabled really when they return to Earth? Uh, and then finally, uh, there's a lot of interest in animal studies as well uh, for un understanding their anatomy and physiology, understanding how they develop, you know, from fertilized eggs or uh, whatever their method of reproduction is. And, and then once they develop, how do they behave in a microgravity environment? Can they carry out their usual activities and their usual routines? Or do they adapt as well? And uh, the classic initial experiment for that was, in fact, a student experiment. Uh, the two spiders, Anita and Arabella, that went on Skylab uh, simply to answer the question, can a spider spin a web in space? Uh, because that's a gravity-dependent activity. And all animals, even the, the most rudimentary, have some kind of gravity sensors in them. Uh, so can they do that in space? And it's just a very basic question, and the experiment was run, and uh, the basic result was, yes, they can. They can't do it immediately very well, but they adapt, and over the period of two to three days, they're doing webs as well as they did on the ground. Um, so sometimes it's really a very simple question that can lead 
into uh, a real burst in knowledge. And uh, so my parting thought is that fascinating things happen in microgravity. I'm sure that the experiences, uh, the experiments that you worked on uh, would have yielded or will yield uh, fascinating results as well. So keep at it. Um, uh, it. Keep at it not only through this student spaceflight experiment program, uh, but through your schooling. And if this develops to be your passion, uh, you may be part of the space science research community of the future as an adult. I wish you all very well. It's great to see you here. Uh, Jeff says we have time for a couple of questions, so if anybody has a question, I'll try to answer. Remember, I'm not a scientist, though. I'm a historian. Oh, I should mention, I, I forgot to mention this, some of the experiment apparatus from microgravity experiments is on display in this gallery, and later when you walk around, um, if you come to this case where you see Sally Ride and Guy Bluford's uh, spacesuits, uh, behind them are uh, three cases about doing science on the space shuttle. And uh, one of the most interesting and probably fun experiences um, that some of the scientists had in space was to do a rotating chair exhibit. And we have one of those rotating chairs here. And uh, you sit in the chair and you're either sitting upright or on your side or on your back and spun around or oscillated back and forth. And you're wearing goggles with cameras in them that, and you have contact lenses that have little marks on them so the scientists who are watching you can see how your eyes are moving as you're being rotated around and what happens when you stop. And this is all part of a study of the uh, vestibular system, the inner ear and eye connection and also the astronaut's sense of what their body position is. So we have a rotating chair on that side and also some of the life science um, ex equipment. Uh, on every life science mission involving human beings, there's blood collection, urine collection, and saliva collection. And that sounds kind of messy, but they do it in a clean way. But some of that equipment is over there for collecting body fluids. And then on uh, this case on this side is some crystal growth experiment. And uh, throughout the shuttle era and now on the space station, uh, crystal growth is a really uh, active form of research, uh, both for biological crystals and also for um, crystals that can be used as semiconductors. And in space, those crystals form larger and they form more perfectly than they do on Earth. And so there's a great deal of interest in crystal growth in space by the pharmaceutical interests uh, who are interested in making uh, new drugs. Uh, we have crystalline structures in our body, proteins and such, and the drugs match up to them, kind of like jigsaw puzzle pieces. So if they can study biological crystals and pharmaceutical crystals in space, they can make better drugs. And uh, likewise, semiconductor crystals, uh, which, you know, are in everything now, um, can be formed more perfectly in space. So there's some, some crystal growth apparatus over there. And there are different ways of growing crystals in space, in furnaces and in, in uh, spinning, um, uh, devices and in containerless devices, in solutions or not in solutions. It's a very active field of research. So take a look uh, back there and see some flown in space hardware. No questions? Okay, well, thank you. Carry on.